going to bed earlier often doesn't work because that's not how you set your circadian rhythm. That's how you affect what? Sleep pressure, right? That's how you affect sleep pressure. So you, if you're off, uh, if your wake drive is off because you're not getting enough light, especially earlier in the day, uh, going to bed earlier may not work for you. Now, if it does, great, keep doing it. But for a lot of people, it doesn't work. What's up, my friend, and welcome back to another episode of the Legendary Life Podcast. I'm your host, celebrity trainer and high-performance health coach, Ted Rice. This is a podcast for men and women who are looking to boost their energy and upgrade their health. So get ready to learn proven health, fitness, and mindset strategies to unlock your full potential. And today I'm back with the Sleep Masterclass Part 2. Now, last episode I did Sleep Masterclass Part 1, where I talked about the two processes that drive your sleep. We also talked about the different stages of sleep. We also went into basic sleep hygiene. So if you didn't listen to that one, you want to go back and listen to that. Whether you go to my website, legendarylifepodcast.com, or wherever you listen to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher, you want to listen to that episode first, because that sets the stage for everything we're going to cover here. So if you find yourself listening to this episode and you're like, well, I don't really know what you're talking about and I'm not sure... What you're saying here, Ted, you want to go back to that first episode because it'll provide you with those foundational principles that we're going to build on. So what is today's episode about? Very simple. It's about hacking each phase of your sleep. So the title is how to hack your deep and REM sleep for better recovery and productivity. So we're going to go into how to fall asleep faster. If you're one of those people who toss and turns at the beginning of the night, just it takes you so long to fall asleep. We're going to go into how to fix that. For those of you who wake up, but you, you get in bed, you try everything and you just keep waking up at weird times. Maybe you, you're set your alarm clock or, or you're set to wake up at seven or eight or whatever it is, but you end up waking at, up at 5.30 or six. So you wake up earlier. We're going to talk about how to sleep longer. And for those of you who get woken up frequently during the night, we're going to talk about how to improve what's called sleep efficiency. That's how long you stay in bed versus how long you stay asleep. And this was a game changer when I learned about this concept. And I'm going to share with you some things about how to get that, uh, how to stay asleep longer for the time you're actually in bed. We're also going to cover how to get more restful sleep and how to hack your REM sleep. And like I said at the beginning, Uh, your deep sleep as well. Let's jump into today's episode. I'm really excited to talk about this with you because it's just one of those things that we can't, we're, we're just scratching the surface with sleep and how to get better sleep. And I'll tell you, we're, I want to preface this episode by telling you our modern age is just so busy. The internet is available 24 seven so is entertainment. If you live in a city, there's always a place you can go. I mean, when I was going out to clubs in Miami Beach, we would go to uh, drink at a restaurant and eat dinner. Then we go to a club uh, till five, four or five in the morning. Then we go to the after hours club, which started after <laughs> the clubs ended at you know five in the morning. And, and there's a place that you can go. It's called Space. Uh, it's, it's famous in Ibiza. If I'm, I'm probably mispronouncing that like crazy, but it's called uh, Space and it's very famous in Ibiza, but there's also one in Miami Beach, uh, actually downtown Miami. And that's actually the first one. And you, you would go there and we partied until the sun came up and then some. In fact, it got to the point where this is a little bit of a tangent, but I'm going to tell you anyway. I used to, I was like, hey, I don't want to stay up all night and go to space after staying up all night, that just really sucks. It, it crushes you. So my my friends and I, we go to bed early and then we'd wake up super early, like five o'clock in the morning. And then we go, we go drinking and clubbing at 530 or so. And it, it, it was great because we were partying with everybody, but we we're feeling much better. And actually by the time the evening rolled around, we were already home in the afternoon. So there's all these situations 
where we can go out, we can uh, you know binge watch Netflix or watch or ga- or binge Game of Thrones or whatever your favorite series is. And the issue is we're not getting enough sleep, and it has a huge impact on your health. Sleep loss is a killer. Your risk of heart disease goes up. Your risk of cancer goes up. Obesity goes up. The, your risk of dying early goes up. And it's a thing like like everyone loves to argue about nutrition, right? We're, we're just at our throats, at each other's throats, talking about ketogenic diets versus vegetarian diets versus veganism versus high protein diets. We're just trying to kill ourselves, kill our, kill each other rather over these dumb diet arguments. But when it comes, nobody's talking about sleep. Nobody's trying to push for sleep because everybody knows that it's important, but it's just not popular to talk about. But we're, cause we're too busy late at night arguing with each other on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, right? Or maybe you're arguing about politics. Doesn't matter. The point is, and the problem is, you're not getting enough sleep. In fact, I will argue this right now, that I think so many people are so angry and so triggered and so easily offended because they're not getting enough sleep. And I want you to ask yourself right now, are you one of those people? Do you get triggered easily? Do you see something in the news about Trump or or Pelosi or um, the ketogenic diet or something else. And it just, uh, just makes your blood boil so easily. And if I ask you, well, did you get a night, a uh, good night's sleep the night before you're like, Oh no, I didn't sleep well at all. We can't even, what I'm trying to say here is you can't even trust people to be honest about the way they feel because the way they feel is so influenced by the state of their health in particular, their sleep. And we're just suffering from a sleep deprivation epidemic right now. So I want you to keep this in mind. Whenever you're, whenever someone just is going off on you online or you're seeing something you don't like, I guarantee you that person is not sleeping well. All right. Actually, I'm not going to cover like <laughs> getting off the of social media as part of sleeping better, but I guarantee you if you're that person um, is definitely playing a part. So with that said, let's get into it. Um, The first thing we're going to tackle here is how to fall asleep faster. Now, some of you fall asleep right when your head hits the pillow and you think that's a good thing. It's like, wow, it's not even five minutes. I'm out. I mean, as soon as my head hits the pillow, I close my eyes, I disappear. That's actually a sign that you're sleep deprived. So ideally, it shouldn't take more than 15 to 20 minutes to fall asleep. And this is referred to as sleep latency. Okay. How long it takes you to fall asleep when you lay down. And let's talk about some strategies to sleep faster. Well, the first one I'm going to name here is something you've heard time and time again, and I'm going to keep hitting you over the head with this until it starts to sink in. Uh, Not so that you can parrot it back to your friends at a cocktail party and show off how smart you are about sleep, but until you actually start following this. So avoid blue light two hours before bed. And really that's at least two hours before bed. Get dimmers in your house if you can. I turn off the lights and um, or dim the lights. I also wear blue light blocking glasses. I use carbon shades. They're well-made. They're high quality. They wrap around your face, unlike the Swannies that are super popular. Uh, Swannies look great, but they just don't block the light from around the frame. And also the carbon shades lenses really work well. Uh, Also make sure you have that F dot lock. So this is all stuff that I talked about in the first sleep masterclass, but just to go over it again, briefly. Another thing is you want to adjust your temperature. I'm sure you've noticed how hard it is to sleep when you're too too caught. That's a mixture of hot and cold together, caught. Um, And if you're caught, then uh, you should probably consult a doctor because uh, you got, we're going to actually talk about that, although that is not a thing. That was just my screw up right now because I can't speak English. Um, but if you're too hot or too cold, it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect your sleep quality. And that's because your brain modifies your alertness to cause you to act to protect yourself. What do I mean by that? Well, if you're in 
Antarctica in your bikini or board shorts and you don't find a way to keep you warm, right? What happens, right? You're in this freezing temperature. You're like, oh my gosh, I'm so cold. Oh, I got to find something. You know, you got to, you know, kill a tauntaun and, um, you know, curl up inside of its organs if you're <laughs> If you're a Star Wars fan, or you got to, you know, build an igloo, or you got to do something because you'll die of hypothermia if you don't. All right. And it, it, and what I'm trying to say here is that depending on the temperature, depending on uh, where you find yourself, what type of environment you find yourself in, your brain causes you to take action. Same thing if you found yourself in the desert, in the open air right? You would be like, oh my gosh, it's so hot. You would feel your skin cooking. You'd feel your body overheating, especially if in the morning till the noon time where, when the sun really starts to pick up heat. In fact, uh, most people don't travel in the desert during the day uh, in, unless they have some sort of way to cool down, right? Like uh, AC in a car, but like the nomads in the desert, they rest during the day and start traveling when the sun goes down. So my point is that it makes evolutionary sense that your skin monitors your environmental temperature to let you know about the external conditions and to urge you to take the proper steps to protect yourself. All right? Because if it gets too hot or too cold, then you better do something to modulate it because you could be in danger. So while you may not be in the Arctic or in a desert, if you find yourself in your bedroom with a temperature that is too hot or too cold, you're going to have trouble sleeping. And that's the reason why, because it's designed to get you to take action, to change, you know, change your behavior to protect you. So you got to find that ideal sleeping temperature. So you want to keep your bedroom cool but you also want to keep it on the comfortable side or else it can wake you up. And here's the thing here. And I'm sure you've heard this part. In fact, I talked about it last episode, but here's the part that I didn't talk about. You need to make sure that you, if you sleep with someone, if you have a partner, a husband, wife, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, then you need to work it out with them so that they're comfortable and you're comfortable because their ideal sleep temperature may be different than yours. I need to make sure I stay cool enough because if I don't do that, then I can't sleep at all. If I'm too hot, there's just, I'm going to have horrible night of sleep. Now, some people say, hey, we'll take a hot bath before you get into bed. Now this can work, but it doesn't work for everyone. For example, I'm a person who tends to get hot easily. So if I take a hot bath or use the sauna or something like that, I'm going to have a real problem going to bed. I'm going to I'm going to be heating up. I'm going to be feeling like I'm heating up from the inside and I'm just like unable to get comfortable. So it doesn't work for me and you may be one of those people too and I say this because what do you hear the quote unquote sleep experts say? They just parrot this stuff out like it's um, you know, like it's the thing to do for everybody and it's not, all right? So if you're not a, uh, one of these people I'm talking about, then if you get hot easily, right, then you're going to need to do something to cool you off. I personally take a cold shower. That's what works best for me. So you need to decide to figure out what type of person you are when it comes to temperature. Do you easily get hot or you do you get cold easily or hot easily. And when you figure that out, then you can do the appropriate thing. But uh, don't follow that ridiculous advice that everyone should take a hot shower. All right. That doesn't work. So if you are a person who tends to get cold, then a 10 minute shower at about 40 degrees Celsius or 100 and 104 degrees uh, Fahrenheit shortly before bed should do the trick. But if you're like me, Try taking a cold shower. If you suffer from, um, you know, if you're a person, you lay down in bed, you're trying to fall asleep faster and you think your mind is racing too much, try taking a cold shower. Try taking one for five to 10 minutes and see if it doesn't make a change in how fast you're able to fall asleep. The next thing we can talk about here is your bedding. So you want to optimize the quality of your mattress, your sheets, and your pillows because they affect how well you sleep. 
If you're using a duvet or heavy blankets, that may disrupt your sleep because they add heat to your body. And a lot of people, they like to make their beds look nice, but when it comes to actually sleeping in their bed, it can be a nightmare because it's just got too many covers and duvets. And uh, I used to sleep with these goose down comforters, which feel great, but they make you so hot. It's just terrible. All right. If you're a person like me and you, you overheat easily. So this can also lead to having your room too cold because your sheets too hot are, are too hot and you never quite get to that perfect temperature. In other words, you get to that cot. I'm sorry, terrible joke. But the point is you don't want to be in a situation where you have the covers on and you're like, oh, I'm too hot. Then you take the covers off. Oh, I'm too cold. Then you put the covers back on and it keeps waking you up throughout the night. Does that sound familiar? I'm sure it does to some of you. Also, beds that are too hard or too soft can issue uh, can cause issues as well. I bought a memory foam mattress, a king size memory foam mattress with cooling gel. And the cooling gel was awesome. It works out uh, so well, and I really recommend those. A, cool, uh, a mattress and pillows with cooling gel if you tend to be on the hot side. But it's not just about the heat. It's about beds that are too hard or too soft. So I bought that king size mattress, and it just destroyed my back. I would wake up in the middle of the night. My back was aching. It was just terrible. I actually had to take the bed back. So you want to make sure that your mattress is the right amount of firmness. And unfortunately, I can't tell you what that is because you're going to have to do some experimentation. It took me a little while to figure out I need a pretty firm mattress or else I'm going to have, I'm going to be uncomfortable during the night. If it's too hard, it, it can hurt your back as well, especially if you sleep on your side. Your arm can go numb, especially if you're a bigger person, if you got, in other words, some weight to lose. So you want to take, take that into consideration as well. And as far as um, the sheets are concerned, I would try the bamboo viscose sheets from Royal Tradition. I don't have any relationship with them or anything, but those are the ones that I'm going to get when I, after doing research, I haven't tried these, so I just want to throw that out there, but I'm going to uh, get those when I'm back, when I have a place to live. Right now, I'm homeless, um, which I'm trying, you know, just <laughs> actually traveling the world, having the time of my life, but I'm, you know, kind of joke sometimes and tell people that I'm homeless, uh, which is kind of true. I don't own a place or rent a place at the moment. So uh, when, when I settle down somewhere, those are the sheets that are, I'm, I'm going to buy. And if I figure something else out, I will let you know. Also, Sheeks.com, that's S-H-E-E-X.com, has some interesting sleepwear and bedding. And I don't have a relationship with them at all. I just thought it was kind of interesting. I got turned on to them by reading an article on Human OS, which is Dan Party's website. So let's move on from the bedding. Let's talk about how to calm your monkey mind. So one of the biggest complaints I hear from my clients and even podcast listeners is that their mind races at night. They can't seem to turn it off and it interferes with sleep. And like I mentioned, you might want to try a, a cold shower because they've actually found people with insomnia tend to run hotter. Their brains specifically run hotter uh, during the night. And they've even used some crazy thermoregulation suits that circulate cool water all around your body, and it helps people fall asleep fast. So yes, you can do it temperature-wise, but let's say you've already got your ideal temperature sorted out and you're still having trouble falling asleep. I know what this feels like because I've suffered from it from the past. It's not something that I really suffer from regularly. I actually have a different sleep issue, which I'll share with you in a bit. But what I'm trying to tell you here is it can be exceedingly frustrating to go to bed, especially if you've got something in the morning, like a big presentation at work, or maybe some important event that you need to be 100% on your game for. And it's kind of funny that you're like, oh God, I got to go to bed. Okay. I got this big day tomorrow got to go to bed. And it's just on your mind and you're unable to turn it off, or maybe you work too late. So the thing that you don't want to hear do here is to try harder to go to bed. 
This is the one area where trying hard just backfires time and time again. And this is where meditation can be a lifesaver. So I've med- been meditating for years. Uh, I think it's super powerful and uh, it's been a life changer for me. It's I, I don't drink anymore. I haven't really talked about this much, but I don't drink alcohol hardly ever anymore. And it's not because I'm, uh, you know, I'm one of those people who used to drink a lot, party a lot in my 20s, and now I preach against it. Although I think it's terrible for your health if you do it regularly. But the issue is I just don't need it anymore. And and it's because I started meditating is a big part of it. So I know meditation is something that I'm going to cover more in the future on a separate episode, but I want you to give it a try. Now, most people, if you're like me, you start with an app. You hear about Headspace or the Waking Up app with Sam Harris, and then you give those a try, or Insight Timer, or whatever free meditation app is out there. I was meditating with Headspace for a long time. I I put I put many hours, many 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 hours on Headspace, but I stopped doing it. So you can get started with a with with an app if you'd like. But the real deal is going to a meditation class or mindful class, uh, mindfulness class somewhere, uh, whether that's a Zen Buddhism place, Zen meditation place, or a Vipassana meditation. But I want to challenge you to look around. If you're struggling dealing with a busy mind that you have trouble controlling, look for a meditation. Google your city meditation class or course and go to it. And I got to tell you, I learned how to meditate in Chiang Mai, Thailand. Last year, I sat down in a one-day meditation retreat, then a two-day meditation retreat, and it was a game changer, total game changer. By the way, I don't recommend a 10-day Vipassana retreat. I think it's too much. And at the end of it, most people make it, most people don't even make it through the 10 days. You don't realize, but meditation, it's like, it should be called the meditation boot camp. It's like, oh, welcome to Vipassana meditation. We're going to train mindfulness and we're going to learn how to relax. And their meditation is not relaxing. It calms your mind, but it's not relaxing. It's more like a boot camp. Uh, pains come up when you're sitting in the meditation posture. It gets really frustrating at times. And man, it's tough, but you make it through and you get a meditation practice out of it. But I find that most people who go through the 10-day meditation and um, don't start off in small chunks have a problem with it. So so go and challenge yourself to do a a one-day meditation course, two-day meditation course, and don't jump into the 10-day because uh, you're just going to leave early or hate yourself during it and make it through and never want to meditate again. Give it a try and find someone to learn it from. Don't rely on an app. That has been one of the most powerful things. If I wake up at night or have trouble falling asleep, I meditate to fall asleep faster and it works. Next one, let's tr- let's talk about how to sleep longer. So the odds that you need less than six and a half hours of sleep each night are very small. Only a very, very tiny minority of people have variants of genes that both buffer uh, these people against the, the deleterious consequences of sleep loss and also reduce how much sleep they need. And I've talked about sl- uh, short sleeper genes before. I'm not going to talk about it here, but just know that you're probably, you probably don't have them, all right? So if that's the case, you need seven to nine hours, depending on how, how hard you work, how hard you work your body, all those things. So with that said, how do we sleep longer? Well, the number one thing, or actually not number one thing, we'll get to the number one thing in a bit, but the first thing that we'll talk about here is that you got to reduce caffeine. If you live on caffeine, just know that caffeine blocks the interaction of adenosine with its receptors, right? This is the sleep pressure. When we wake up, our brains start producing adenosine as a byproduct of our metabolism. Caffeine, right? You're, let's say you're tired. You drink some, some coffee and boom, all of a sudden you're awake. How does that work? Well, it blocks those receptors that 
allows adenosine to merge with that cause you to get sleepy because adenosine builds up over the course of, of the time that you're awake and starts causing you to get tired. It's one of the main things that causes you to get tired, at least as far as we know right now. Another thing to let you know is that caffeine stays in your system for a long time. It takes healthy people about six hours on average for their blood caffeine levels to fall to 50% of their peak values. So that's called the half-life. Okay, All drugs, including uh, caffeine, and caffeine, yes, is a drug. You are taking a drug when you drink coffee, just like marijuana or cocaine or whatever. It just happens to not be as crazy, although you couldn't argue about the addictive qualities, especially when you see the Starbucks line every morning, right? So just know that you really have to watch your caffeine intake. The next thing you have to watch out for is reduce alcohol. While alcohol consumption often helps people fall asleep, what it does is it disrupts your sleep later on in the night. So a lot of people say, well, I drink a little bit. It helps me fall asleep. You know, I just have a, a, a nightcap, right? But the problem is that alcohol alters what's called your sleep architecture. In other words, it disrupts the stages of sleep that you cycle through in the middle of the night. If you want to learn more about the cycles of sleep, you got to go back to that first masterclass that I did. And what happens is that alcohol causes you to spend more time in deep sleep, especially early in the night and less time in rapid eye movement sleep or REM sleep. And this is a huge issue. So you want to avoid alcohol before bed. Just don't do it. Personally, I I avoid alcohol. I mean, even when I was drinking regularly, uh, only when I was going out on a date or something would would I drink at night. But because it would always disrupt my sleep, you probably notice the same thing. And you're just, if you're one of these people who drink every day, you're just constantly having poor sleep every day. And you think you're getting used to it, but you're really not. And by the way, if you drink every single day, uh, you got to ask yourself why that is. Okay. I'm, I'm, you know, every once in a while, it's okay. A couple times a week, it's okay. But if you're drinking every day, you've got to ask yourself why that is. Why are you choosing to harm your sleep? cycles to set yourself up for uh, a bad night of sleep just because you want to get a little buzz. You want to take a drug, in other words, to change your neurochemistry to make you feel a little looser. Got a little loose with alcohol, you know? (laughs) Say things that you sometimes regret and do things you sometimes regret. And sometimes you can't even remember what you did. Anyway, enough about that. Uh, You're also more likely to snore when you drink because alcohol is a muscle relaxant. It relaxes the muscles at at the back of your throat and also makes you wake up to use the bathroom. So you've got, if you're having trouble with your sleep, especially sleep for how long you sleep, you've got to watch your alcohol consumption. We've already talked about this one. This is the most important one. Get more sunlight in the morning. Going to bed earlier often doesn't work because that's not how you set your circadian rhythm. That's how you affect what? Sleep pressure, right? That's how you affect sleep pressure. So you, if you're off, uh, if your wake drive is off because you're not getting enough light, especially earlier in the day, uh, going to bed earlier may not work for you. Now, if it does, great, keep doing it. But For a lot of people, it doesn't work. It's usually ineffective. The way to do this is to make sure that you get sunlight in the morning. You don't have to get it directly on your skin, although you can, but you got to get outside. You got to take it in. If you're in an office away from windows all day long and you just have those fluorescent lights bearing down on your eyes and body, you're just going to have disrupted sleep patterns. You're going to suffer from sleep issues. And I know a lot of you work in offices or places where you, you can't just go up to your boss and say, listen, um, this, this windowless office is really disrupting my sleep. So you need to move me to a place where I can get more natural light in the morning so that I can perform better at work and sleep better at night. Probably isn't going to go down. Although I would challenge you to bring that up. Because uh, if they want more out of you at work, it's something that you can do. And if you're a business owner, an entrepreneur who employs people, please work with the human body. 
help your employees work effectively by <laughs> encouraging them to do things that affect their productivity and their health. It's a no-brainer. If you're not doing this, I mean, you're just you're leaving money on the table. You're being inefficient and leaving money on the table. You've got to optimize the physiology of a human being to help maximize their potential. And that's just, I mean, that's what this whole podcast is about. If you need help from that, you contact me. I can help um, outfit your office or coach you on the proper things to do to get your employees and yourself sleeping better. Go to legendarylifepodcast.com and send me an email on there. Now, when you get, let's say that you wake up early, you're one of these people you know about, you're not drinking caffeine late in the day, you're, you're not a person who even drinks a lot, you get your sunlight in the morning, but let's say that you woke up, you, let's say that you're waking up early and having trouble getting back to bed, right? Well, meditation is excellent for this. And I already talked about how to get good at meditation don't rely on an app, although that's okay to get started, but challenge yourself. I wish someone said, hey, stop with the Headspace app. Go to a Vipassana meditation. Go to a Zen center. Uh, there's a saying in Zen that the transference of Zen is a mind-to-mind or heart-to-heart -heart transference, meaning you've got to be around someone who's good at it to get good at it because you're not going to be good at it doing an app or reading a book or watching a YouTube video. We're listening to a podcast. It's just not going to happen. So get around someone who's good and uh, learn from them and learn how to be self-sufficient so that you don't need a guided meditation to, to meditate with. I mean, it's okay to start, but challenge yourself to go deeper. But for those of you who uh, want to do something tonight and you're not going to pick up a meditation practice right away, stretching with deep breathing is the thing that I often return to. A lot of pro uh, people, a lot of problem, problems, proper, blah, 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 uh, can't speak English today. Sorry about that. Uh, even though I did sleep, well, actually, I didn't sleep as long as I could because I woke up a little bit early for a coaching call, um, but I did sleep pretty well. But stretching with deep breathing is a solid thing to do as well. I used to, this is one of my go-tos for years, um, and I still use it sometimes. Sometimes I don't sit and do meditation. Sometimes I, I do deep breathing and try to relax my body, relax the muscles in my body, especially if you're training hard or sit for long periods, your body can really tighten up either from inactivity or from too much activity. Um, yoga can be good for this too. You just have to avoid the more intense postures that cause your muscles to work hard because it can be too stimulating. Um, and also, I'm going to be talking about supplements later, but supplements can help with this too. So let's talk about sleep efficiency next. What is sleep efficiency? Well, this is a game changer for me because I was like, man, I don't feel well. I've been in bed for eight hours, but I still feel like I, I didn't sleep that much. So I got the Aura Ring. I plugged it big time in the first episode. And although I do have a relationship with them, it's exclusively for my one-on-one -on -one coaching clients. So I can't give you a promo code for the Aura Ring, but I'll tell you, it is worth the money that you pay for it and more. It's worth double or even, I pay a thousand bucks for the Aura Ring easy. Okay. And um, it is just, it's a no brainer when it comes to sleep. I would pay as much as an iPhone for this uh, easily. It is a game changer. So one thing, one of the things that the Aura Ring taught me was that I'm not asleep for as long as I think I'm asleep. Now I might be lying in bed for seven or eight hours, but I'm only actually sleeping five or six. In fact, let me look at my readout here on the Aura Ring app and I'm going to the sleep. So I was in bed for eight hours and nine minutes last night, but my real sleep time was six hours and 52 minutes. So I spent an hour and 17 minutes awake in bed last night. So I was in bed for eight hours and nine minutes, but only about seven hours, a little bit less than seven hours was the time that I was asleep. I never knew. I mean, I, I kind of knew it was going on, but the aura ring just dialed it in for me. It, it quantified it and showed me, right? And uh, it's super powerful. So you're probably not even going to be able to take advantage of this 
unless you're tracking your sleep. Now, sleep the sleep cycle app I hear is really good as well. But it, you know what? Just save up for an aura ring and, and get one. Just do yourself a favor. Uh, so this is called sleep efficiency. The percentage of time lying down that you're actually sleeping. So even if you go to bed at a reasonable time, it doesn't matter if you're sleeping inefficiency, inefficiently. So this is how I learn how to really dial my sleep in. And as far as the science is concerned, by the way, you're probably wondering, well, uh, has is there like a particular number of sleep efficiency that's considered optimal? And the truth is there just hasn't been enough research yet to determine something that specific. Obviously, you know, you want to be asleep for as much of the time that you're in bed as possible. However, again, it's just, it's not clear what's normal. We just don't know those answers yet. However, some experts estimate a rough ballpark of 85% or above as a decent place to be. And uh, I'll tell you right now, my sleep efficiency was 84%. Now, this is something that I have a problem with, by the way. And it's just, uh, you know, that is how it is. That, that's something that I'm working on. Um, my sleep efficiency was 85% the night before. Ooh, it was 78 the night before that. It was 57. I had a really bad night of sleep that night. Uh, it was 82%, 79%, 81%. So I could be more efficient with my sleep. I wake up too much, although I do have an 89 and an 88 in there. So it's really important that you um, that you shoot for this. But again, you're going to need something to help you quantify it to get feedback as to whether what you're doing is working. And so how do you affect your sleep efficiency? Well, most of the tips for impo- improving sleep efficiency are things I've already covered. Avoid blue light two hours before bedtime. Get rid of the TVs, computers, lights, and smartphones, or use dimmers, apps like F.Lux, or blue light blocking glasses. Make sure you block out the light. I find that I can't sleep as well, even if there's a bit of light, and it's something I've been struggling with. It's one of the things that have been throwing off my sleep because I, I stay in Airbnbs all the time, but I've stayed in enough different places to learn like, wow, when I'm in a, a, a place that's optimized with blackout curtains and it's super dark, wow, I can get it cold, dark, and quiet. Whoa, I sleep so much better. So um, definitely do follow all the tips that we've shared, right? And also going to bed and waking up at the same time or relatively the same time every day. Also, don't exercise intensely right before bed and avoid alcohol and caffeine. However, there's something that nobody is talking about, and that is air pollution. So we don't think about it, but we take 1 million breaths of air every month without thinking about air quality and how it affects our bodies and minds. And according to the World Health Organization, 92% of the world's population is exposed to damaging levels of air pollution. And most of this is in the developing world, but a lot of it is also uh, in, in places uh, where we'll get to where you can check this out, but it's in, in a lot of different places in the modern world is where, as well. So poor indoor, indoor air quality is a problem of varying degrees depending on where you live because it can be up to five times more polluted than outdoor air. And it also is responsible for 4 million deaths per year worldwide from household pollution and exposure to household air pollution almost doubles the risk for childhood pneumonia and is responsible for 45% of all pneumonia deaths in children less than five years old. This is a huge deal, people, and nobody's talking about it. And I never really even knew that much about air pollution. And again, it's one of those things everybody's arguing about Keto versus low fat, what is carbs are bad for you or fat is good for you or, you know, whatever. Listen, you can eat the most perfect diet, but if you're not getting enough sleep and you're exposed to air pollution, you're screwed. Okay. So, and household air pollution is also a major risk factor for lower respiratory infections and contributes to 28% of adult deaths to pneumonia. This is, again, World Health Organization figures. And so what are we talking about? We're talking about those uh, 
We're talking about CO2, carbon monoxide, in other words. We're talking about uh, appliances like gas fires and cookers that give this off because you can, you know, breathe it in, the, breathe in the fumes can cause problems. We're talking about volatile organic compounds from things like paint finishes, disinfectants, um, varnishes, and uh, not good. We're talking about particulate matter. So these little particles that when you breathe them in, they go through the membranes in your lungs and actually get into your circulatory system. Really terrible stuff. I mean, some of us, uh, uh, I, I don't know how, you know, radon gas is... Um, how common it still is, but I know that can be an issue as well. And besides shortening your life and giving and killing your kids, it can give you everything from allergies to asthma to concentration issues, uh, not to mention how it affects your quality of sleep. In fact, researchers look for correlations between exposure to air pollution and looked into the quality of sleep of 1,863 people in six U.S. cities. And what they found was there was about 60% higher odds of having low sleep efficiency if you had exposure in the highest uh, quartile of air pollution. So in other words, if you are in one of the most uh, 75, if you're in the top 25% of the most polluted uh, areas of the U.S. or wherever, you're going to have a 60% chance of having lower sleep efficiency. So let's talk about what you can do here. Well, you can monitor your air quality, and that's the first one. Um, you can do that. Uh, you can just forget about monitoring it and take preventive steps you can change your AC filters to HEPA filters, H-E-P-A filters, because those are excellent, but you have to make sure your AC can handle it. So you can also get air purifying plants. I'm not going to talk to you about which ones they are because I'm going to mangle their names, their scientific names, and some of them uh, I don't know the uh, uh, the common names for. You can Google NASA Clean Air Study and you, you can learn all the different types of plants uh, that can help detoxify your home. You can buy an air quality purifier. So something like a Dyson Pure Cool, uh, that's a good one. Or uh, I can't pronounce this, but Xiaomi, it's a Chinese brand, which actually I was in uh, Chiang Mai. I've learned a lot about air pollution since being in Thailand because I've been personally affected by it. Uh, I had a cough and it really messed me up, messed up my sleep. Uh, I got an, a, a lung infection from it and I was like, what the hell is going on? And it's the, I was in Chiang Mai and they were doing the, during the burning season and, and it became the most polluted city in the world. I topped the charts as the most polluted city in the world a few times. So it, this is really important. And even I was working out in the gym and this Chinese woman brought in an air purifier. I was like, oh, I know where that one. It's a Xiaomi or whatever. Um, so there's the Dyson Pure Cool or that X-I-A-O-M-I. -I. Uh, by the way, the National Sleep Foundation recommends the Bedroom Machine by Austin Air. So those are some that you can look into. The, the Chinese one is the cheapest one. No surprise there, but it seems to be pretty good quality. Although I would have you consider uh, if buying something Chinese just because it's cheaper is uh, you know the best way to go. Why not spend a bit more money and get uh, you know an American um, brand right uh, to help out your fellow Americans? I think that's important. So those are things you can do. And something that you want to make sure that you're looking into. And what you can do is you can download the app Air Visual. So Air Visual uh, gives you real-time monitoring of the air pollution in your city. And they also sell a sensor. So it's a free app, but they also sell a sensor. And you want to just kind of look into things and make sure that you're not suffering with issues with air pollution. So look it up and make sure, because if you're suffering from air pollution 
from the environment that you're in, that's something that you want to take into it account. And even more importantly, even if you're not in a a polluted city or town, you want to make sure that the air quality of your home is good as well. All right. So very important, very important. And let's get into how to have more restful sleep. So restless sleep is when you have frequent wake-ups and we know that it's less restorative than uninterrupted sleep. And it's one of the biggest causes of daytime sleepiness, according to sleep experts, uh, sleep medicine experts. And common causes of restless sleep include stress, anxiety, sleep apnea, noise, in other words, snoring from your partner uh, or your snoring. That used to wake me up when I snored. Pets, car horns, Also, if you've got a partner who's having sleep issues, if you're disrupting your partner's sleep or your partner's disrupting your sleep, you need to address it. Also, waking up to urinate, guys with prostate issues or women um, also have this issue. Not exactly sure why, because women don't have prostates, but let's talk a little bit about how to solve these things. So we already talked about stress and anxiety. You've got to we're going to do a whole nother one on stress and anxiety, but you've got to handle uh, your life. You need to have the conversations in your life that you need to have that you're avoiding. You need to address the issues in your life that you need to, that, um, that need to be addressed, that you're not stepping up to the plate to, but that are causing you anxiety and stress because meditation isn't going to fix it. Meditation won't fix your life. You'll just have it, you'll have to keep coming back to meditation because you'll be constantly triggered uh, by these things that you're just not addressing. Sleep apnea, you need to lose weight. And that's as simple as that. Noise, well, you can wear earplugs, you can um, you know, soundproof your house, you can use white noise machines. If you've got a partner who is disrupting your sleep, have a talk with them about it, find some solutions. So let's talk about how to get more REM sleep. So REM sleep is one of the most important phases that we cycle through during sleep. And during REM sleep, the brain is actually more active. And this is when vivid dreams occur. And as the name implies, your eyes move quickly in various directions and your heart beats faster. And although we don't know as much as we'd like about REM sleep and its importance, we do know that it plays a crucial role in memory, learning, and mood. And scientists are also starting to understand the consequences of not getting enough REM sleep. And one of the big issues here is that as we get older, we seem to get less REM sleep. We also seem to get less total sleep and less deep sleep. But uh, REM sleep is super important because A recent study showed that when people experience less REM intervals during the night, it increases your chances of developing cognitive and memory issues by 9%. Now, that's not 90% or 80%. It's only, you know, 9%. But still, the study found that this was an issue. So if you want to avoid cognitive issues and memory issues, you want to make sure that you're getting enough quality sleep overall, but specifically REM sleep. Uh, you, if you're having an issue with your memory, with learning things, um, you want to make sure that you're getting enough REM sleep. Now, how do you know if you're getting REM sleep? Or a ring, baby. You got to invest in it. Or some other type of wearable that can pick up whether you're in deep sleep or REM sleep or light sleep. By the way, interestingly, the study found that deep sleep didn't have the connection to decreased cognitive and memory issues that REM sleep did. So you might ask, how much REM sleep do we need? Researchers found that at least 20% of your sleep needs to be spent in REM sleep because that was the cutoff point where no cognitive problems were detected with age. But if the percentage of REM sleep dropped below 17%, issues started to arise. And personally, I don't get enough REM sleep. I wake up to use the bathroom too frequently, especially if I don't have my bedroom blacked out 100%. So I wake up easily and I always wake up during REM sleep. And if you're dreaming and you wake up during your dream, that's you're in REM sleep. Um, If you ever woke up and you felt like you were being ripped out of the depths 
of, uh, you know, your mother's womb, for lack of a better explanation or, or analogy there, that's deep sleep where you feel like, you know, where you ripped into reality. But if you're having a dream and then you wake up, REM is actually very light sleep. So uh, just to let you know. So how do you get more REM sleep? Again, light exposure. REM sleep is regulated by your circadian rhythms. It happens later on in the night, later on in your sleep. So uh, you've got to make sure that you're getting enough natural light during the day and avoiding light at night. Get a full night of sleep because if you don't sleep enough, you simply won't give your body enough time to cycle through these different stages of sleep until it hits REM sleep enough time so that you get a quality amount of it. Also, avoid drugs like caffeine, alcohol, and marijuana. So uh, in particular, al alcohol and marijuana reduce the amount of REM sleep that you get and increase the amount of deep sleep. In fact, with marijuana, they found that, and I used to be a big marijuana smoker during my 20s, uh, unfortunately smoked it way too much, uh, probably has left some damage in my lungs and possibly to my brain, which is why I mess up English a lot. Just kidding. <laughs> that probably has more to do with some of my sleep issues than my marijuana use but uh, from the past. But just know that so, so really interesting about marijuana because I know a lot of people still smoke the weed out there. So what it happens is marijuana helps you get deeper sleep, but it also reduces the REM sleep that you get. And then when you stop smoking marijuana, people report getting vivid dreams because you have this rebound effect where you have a lot more REM sleep. And uh, that's not good. All right. You want to have normal levels of deep sleep and REM sleep. And if you're constantly stoned on the weed or drunk on the alcohol, alcohol doesn't give you a rebound effect with your REM sleep, but it definitely decreases the amount. You're just not going to be functioning at a high enough level or as high as you could. So really keep that in mind when you're looking, if you're feeling like you're not able to learn things or focus and your cognitive function, you keep messing up words that you know well, like I'm doing today, you, you're probably a bit uh, low on the REM sleep. How do you know? Got to get the aura ring or some way to track it. Uh, let's talk about how to get more deep sleep, and then we'll wrap things up here. So deep sleep is the most restorative and rejuvenating sleep stage. This is where you repair your body, grow muscle, all those good things that happen, repair body tissues. Also, when you're in deep sleep, your blood pressure and your heart rate drop and your breathing slows. You're very relaxed and difficult to awaken. As I told you before, if you ever went to bed late and you, you had to set the alarm in the morning and the alarm goes off and it's just like, you're just ripped from this amazing, like dark, deep sleep, like you were just, I don't know. I keep thinking of being in the womb. That's what keeps coming back. Like I'm just, you're just so deep into sleep that uh, you're in a different world. That's deep sleep, right? When you're woken up out of some vivid, crazy dream, like I was playing, uh, I was playing in a band the other night. Um, for those of you who don't know, I played music. I even studied mu music for a little while. I played in jazz bands. I played in a reggae band. So I had a dream that I was playing the guitar and playing the bass and having a good time. I forget what happened after that. But uh, I woke up in the middle of the dream. That's REM sleep. So deep sleep is when you're really, really deep. And there's so many, basically everything that we already talked about here is a way to hack your deep sleep. So it's kind of the easier one to get. REM sleep seems to be much more difficult. There's um, sleep, deep sleep seems to be dependent on the sleep pressure as opposed to the wake drive. So it, it, this is my understanding. I'll double check this again, but from what I've read and studied, what happens is the REM sleep is dependent on your wake drive, so your circadian rhythm, but deep sleep comes whenever you go to sleep, right? So it doesn't matter. It's more of a function of uh, the sleep pressure that we talked about in the first masterclass. And, and again, to quantify this properly, to track it, you need something 
like a uh, like the sleep cycle app or an Oura Ring to make sure that you're actually making a difference here. With REM sleep, it's a little bit easier because you can you can kind of pay attention to how many dreams you had and how well you can remember your dreams. If you know people who remember their dreams well, those are people who have good cycles of REM sleep most likely. And if you can't remember your dreams or you feel like you don't dream at all, you've got more of an issue with REM sleep. So there are so many ways of improving the deep sleep and a lot of it we've already covered. So just make sure you're doing all that stuff. And as I start to learn more and uh, interview different experts. We'll start to get more specific about it, but everything that we talked about is great for improving deep sleep, and it's the easier one to get for most people compared to REM sleep. So I'm going to wrap things up now. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and learned a lot, and I promise you the things that we went over today, listen to this episode again. Make sure you're applying it Try to troubleshoot. Oh, I'm having a problem with falling asleep uh, as fast uh, or, or it takes me too long to fall asleep. Go back to that section. I'll have all the breakdown of the show notes in this episode on my website at legendarylifepodcast.com. So make sure you check that out. You can go to the section that you want to go to and listen to it again. So make sure you do that. I hope you have an amazing week and I'll speak to you soon. Hey there, Ted Rice here again, and I want to know something. If I invited you to work with me to uncover your personalized blueprint to get your health and fitness under control once and for all, and just to be clear, I'm talking about long-term consistent results that are easier than any program you've ever done before, no struggles or stress or restrictive diets or even extreme workouts, would you take me up on that offer? This is the same guidance I've used to help busy CEOs, other executives, and even celebrities, including Richard Branson and Robert Downey Jr., to stay in great shape while still having a life. To learn more, what I want you to do is go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash chat and message the word offer, that's O-F-F-E-R, to my chat team. And what they're going to do is they're going to ask you a few questions to make sure that this will actually work for you. Then once they determine that, they'll share the specifics of how I can help you. So again, if you're interested, go to legendarylifepodcast.com slash chat and message the word offer to my team and they're going to handle it from there. And just a P.S., This offer has limited spots available. We're talking about 12 committed people max. So if you want to know more, go to legendarylightpodcast.com slash chat, and my team will be more than happy to assist you. Hope you're having a great one and talk to you soon.